I continue with our series now on these 10 questions. You know that I started them before Christmas and we've been working through them. And we come to a very difficult one this morning. Last week, when we looked at suffering, I said we're probably at the hardest of these questions. Well, I've changed my mind. I think this week is even harder. And the question is, uh, what is the unpardonable or unforgiven, unforgivable sin? Is there a sin which God cannot and will not pardon? So we come to look at the unforgivable sin. And it's been a question that has troubled Christians over the years. No doubt if you've walked with the Lord for some time, you've probably asked yourself the question, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Have I crossed the line where there's no return? Am I, will I remain unforgiven in the end? Will I be lost forever? Will I be excluded from the kingdom of God? Have I committed the unpardonable sin? And don't worry that you've asked yourself that question because as I read and did research, it would seem that Christians down the years have asked that same question. In fact, I was quite surprised to see that great Christians who did great things for God even ask that question. One of them was John Bunyan. You know, he wrote that great book, The Holy War, and even the more uh, popular book, um, Pilgrim's Progress, probably one of the most read books in the whole English language, Pilgrim's Progress. And yet for years he struggled with the question, have I committed the unpardonable sin? You see, the problem is Satan is the doubter. Satan is the doubter and the deceiver. And he comes to us in those quiet, dark moments to deceive us and rob us of our assurance. So we come to look at this quite difficult subject today under three headings. Firstly, I'm going to point out to you the rejection that Jesus faced, both from his family and from the religious community. Then I'm going to show you the response of Jesus to their accusation, and then we'll close off with the reassurance that Jesus gives to us all. So we're going to root it and base it in um, Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, which was read to us. I remind you just of those opening two verses. It said, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. First thing I want to point out to you there is the rejection of Jesus and his family said he's, um, he's deceived. He's out of his mind. Now, you need to note that Jesus was growing in popularity. It says so there in the passage, to the extent that he didn't even have time to eat. He was growing in popularity. It was expanding. It was exploding. People were coming to Jesus from all over, from the farms, from the villages, from the towns, from the city. They wanted to be in contact with this phenomena. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, there's 400 years of silence where heaven is as brass and where God doesn't seem to speak to the nation. Now John the Baptist bursts onto the stage of human history saying there's a great prophet coming and Jesus bursts onto the stage as that prophet. He was the phenomena of his day. After so many years of quiet, here he is and he's doing the most remarkable things. There is no disease there is no disease that he cannot cure. Now, as a, as a parent with a child that's ill or a relative that's ill or a father that's ill, surely distance is no object to you. You are going to get to Jesus, come what may, to get your relative or your child healed. And so they flocked to him from the farms and the villages and the towns and the cities. They had to just be with him. And now we can see something of that when he feeds the group of people. On the one time he feeds 4,000. Another occasion he feeds 5,000. And the Bible puts the rider 5,000 men. Apart from the women and children. So let's double that men and women and let's multiply that a few times over with the kids. 20,000 plus people Jesus is feeding and talking to. 
This is amazing. His family hear about this. Now remember, Jesus is 30 when he starts his ministry. For all those early years, he was in the carpenter shop. Just one of the crowd. A little bit different, but just a worker in the carpenter shop. And now, he's the talk of the world. Now, crowds are coming to him. What has been the transition? So the family says, we need to go and rescue him. We, we need to go and take charge of him. For he is out of his mind. Before he hurts himself, before he hurts others, and before he brings the dignity of our family's name down, let's go and rescue Jesus. In fact, it's interesting to note that that word to take charge of him is the same word used for when John the Baptist was taken charge of and put in prison. So in other words, they say, we must rescue Jesus from the public domain and put him away privately, that he can't hurt himself or hurt others. He is out of his mind, the family says. At this stage, obviously, they didn't believe it was only after the resurrection that they came to faith. Just to pause there for a moment. It's interesting his family said they, he is out of his mind. Those words are still used for Christians by unbelieving family. I think when I got converted, my parents thought I was out of my mind. I was the only Christian in the family. The rest thought I was out of my mind. Thank God they've all come to faith now. But at that time, they thought I was out of my mind. Probably some family members think you are out of your mind being here. Why? Here on a Sunday. Look at the weather. You should be out on the beach. You should be enjoying yourself. You're out of your mind to be the group of Christians in church. You're out of your mind to plan to come to Bible study in the week. You're out of your mind to give money, lots of money to the church. You're out of your mind. You're out of your mind to read the Bible every day. You're out of your mind to pray. You're out of your mind to be looking for the coming again of Christ. You are out of your mind. Your work colleagues probably think you're out of your mind. It's interesting, when the Apostle Paul was before Felix, the leader, the leader said this, You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted at him, for your great learning has made you insane. People still they say that about us. They said that about Jesus. If they accused him, he says, they will accuse you also. So that's the first thing. He was deceived. But even worse in our passage, the religious leaders say he's not only deceived, he's demented. He's demented. See there from verse 22 of our passage. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem, he is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Now, these were the scribes and the Pharisees. These were the religious hierarchy, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. What's interesting to note, they were like a bunch of politicians from other sides of the spectrum. They never really agreed with each other, these religious leaders. They were always criticizing each other. They were always slandering one another, very much as happens in politicians with politicians today. But when they want to accuse Jesus... When they want to get Jesus off the scene because, quite frankly, he's quite an embarrassment to them, they all stand shoulder to shoulder together. And they come, the Bible says they come down from Jerusalem. Interesting. The Bible always uses that term, down from Jerusalem. Being, having gone to the Holy Land twice, um, Jerusalem is high, and you, you go down to other places from Jerusalem. But what's more so, they came down from Jerusalem as a group comes down from head office. The, the, this was the hit squad. This was the squad that was going to evaluate this Jesus. This was the, the investigation group from head office. They send them down to get this man out of the way because he's far too popular and he's taking away their market. 
they come down from Jerusalem. And I want you to note, these weren't ignorant people. These were scribes and Pharisees. In other words, the scribes rewrote the Bible over and over and over. They, they were copyists who copied the original script. And when they copied, they would have copied Isaiah 53, which would have spoken about the one who's the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, the one who's despised and rejected, the one who's crucified. They would have written about that. They would have written in, in Isaiah 9 about the one who would be born of a virgin. They would have written about the one who would be born in Bethlehem. They would have written about Psalm 22, my hands and my feet you have pierced. They would have written about all those things. They knew about the Messiah and when they come and when they listen to his claims with this background of knowledge they listen to his claims, they listen to his teaching, they see his work, they witness the healings, they witness all that Jesus does and now they make their audit now they make their assessment from a place of knowledge and sight and you know what they conclude? Quite right. They conclude he is of Baalzebub. Now, Baalzebub was part of um, the, the Lord of Baal, or, or the Lord of Demons, the Lord of the Flies, the Lord of Dung, the Lord of Excreta. That's what they say. This is a massive unparalleled insult to the work and ministry of Christ. In fact, Dr. John MacArthur beautifully put it when he put it this way. This is an oozing, loathsome, malevolent, odious accusation against Christ. Words well chosen. This was a huge... To look at Jesus, to see what he's doing to hear him teach as no man taught and say this is of the pit of hell this is of the devil Jesus says you're being illogical he says if you say I've got the devil why am I casting out the devil if you say I've got the devil why am I promoting the kingdom of God he says a kingdom divided by itself cannot stand and so he shows them how illogical they are. May I just pause there again, as I did the last time? They maligned him unjustly. They slandered him unjustly. They said unkind things about him, and they will do it about you and I. They will do it about you and I. They will say unkind things about us because we associate with Jesus. Jesus said that if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. Didn't he say that in, in Matthew 5? Um, Blessed are you when people insult you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. They call Jesus Beelzebub. What will they call you and I? We will be slandered. And so we see the rejection of Jesus under those two headings. Firstly, they said he was mad and now they say he's demonic. How does he respond? That's what we see secondly. What is Jesus' response? Jesus says, think about it. You're not being logical. Satan cannot be divided against himself. If I'm for Satan, then the, my own kingdom will destroy me. Satan doesn't do that. I'm opposed to Satan. I'm on the other side of Satan. But then he warns them. He doesn't only show them that their reasoning is unfounded. You'll note that there in, in verse 23. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided about, about itself, it cannot stand. So he says, your reasoning is un illogical. But then he warns them. He goes on, he says, In fact, no one can enter the strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, exactly what Jesus will do to Satan on the cross, tie him up. I tell you the truth, all sins of blasphemy of men will be forgiven, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is what he's saying. He's saying, you're on dangerous ground. 
you're now on dangerous ground. You have said, the work I'm doing, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, the ministry I'm doing, which is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is unclean. It's ungodly. It's filthy. He says you're insulting the Spirit of God. To reject Christ in the light of knowledge. Remember, I made it quite clear. These weren't ignorant people. These weren't people who had no knowledge. They had plenty of knowledge about Christ. And from a place of knowledge, very important that I underline that, from a place of knowledge and clear observation, they say we've made an assessment and this man is evil and his work is evil. So they call the work of the Holy Spirit evil. After looking at his life, his teaching, his preaching, his conduct, his love, they say this is evil stuff. Jesus says you're in danger of crossing a line into the unpardonable sin. You see, the unpardonable sin is not lying. The unpardonable sin is not blasphemy. It's not stealing. It's not murder. It's not abortion. It's not adultery. It's not premarital sex. It's not homosexuality. It's not drunkenness. It's not drug addiction. It's not violence. It's not incense. It's not those things. In fact, all sin is forgivable. I could take you to a plethora of beautiful verses dripping with grace that shows us the forgiveness of God. I quoted one when we were at the table earlier from um, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. Or Psalm 103, verse 3. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. The alls of Scripture mean all. He forgives all my sins. But the sin he won't forgive, the exception, is blasphemy against the Spirit. And you might say, where does the Holy Spirit come into this? Put your thinking cap on. Who wrote the Scriptures? 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 31 said, Men did not pen the Scriptures, but they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Mary conceived Christ by the Holy Spirit. Jesus started his ministry after his baptism by the Holy Spirit. Jesus went into the desert led by the Spirit. Jesus preached the gospel by the Spirit. The Spirit and the work of Christ are so intertwined they are one. To reject Christ is to reject the Holy Spirit. Salvation is of the Spirit. You can't be saved unless the Spirit draws you. You can't be saved unless the Spirit opens your heart to the Word. You can't be saved unless the Spirit shows you the beauty of Jesus. You see, salvation and the Holy Spirit are so intertwined. So to reject Christ, to call unholy, unclean the work of Christ is to reject the Holy Spirit and to commit the unpardonable sin. The unforgivable sin. See, some of you are studying the book of Hebrews with me, and I know we've just started our study of the book of Hebrews, and we're going to continue. And we've, we crossed in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, uh, it said, and, and verse 3 and 4, how shall we escape? So it's a rhetorical question, there is no escape. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? In fact, in this church, and listening on the web, you're in a dangerous position because you are knowledgeable. Remember, I made it quite clear, those Pharisees sinned against knowledge. They knew the truth and they turned from the truth. You know the truth. Don't turn from the truth. Turn to the truth. Maybe the clearest passage I can read, and sorry, it's a bit of a strong passage, but the Bible is strong. Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only fearful expectation of judgment and raging fire. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy. How much more severely do you think a person deserves to be punished who has trampled 
the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing, uh, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctifies him. Here it comes. And who has insulted the Spirit of grace. So the writer of Hebrews says, to reject Christ when you have knowledge of him and to continue to do that, you have forfeited the forgiveness of God who has insulted the spirit of grace. It is the unpardonable sin. C.S. Lewis, who wrote that amazing book, Mere Christianity, which made a profound effect on Christianity in Europe some years ago, he posed the question and he said, you cannot just accept Jesus as a good man and as a good teacher. He doesn't leave us room for that. He's either a lunatic, a liar, or the Lord. He's either a lunatic, a liar, or the Lord. May I just pastorally say, if you're sitting in this church or listening to this on the web, and you fear maybe I've committed the unpardonable sin, hit the carpet with your knees. Get on your knees and ask the Lord in his grace to forgive you because the Bible says he turns no one away. The person who commits the unpardonable sin is the person who lives the rest of their life in such a place as from knowledge re rejecting Christ and never turning back. It's not ever for us or me as a pastor ever to point a finger at a person and say they've committed the unpardonable sin. That's God's business. My job, your job, is to share with people as long as there's life, there's hope. The thief on the cross turned in his dying moments. As long as there's life, there's hope. No one needs stay in the unpardonable sin territory. We might cross the, the line and come to Christ who forgives every sin and heals every disease. Lastly, I want to just point out to you, uh, hopefully um, there'll be a moment of encouragement here, the reassurance. Now, you need to continue reading the passage as we did. It said, Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone to call him, and the crowd was sitting around him, told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. So the, the family comes to take charge of the madman. How does Jesus respond? He says, Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him. Here, here are my mother and my brothers. Note this, whoever does God's will is my mother and my sister and my brother. What's he showing us? He's showing us who will be saved. Who will come into the family of God? We don't come into the family of God because of our background and our breeding, but we come into the family of God when we do the will of God. What's the will of God? What's the will of God? God's greatest will, God's greatest desire, God's greatest ambition for you and me is to surrender our lives to Christ. These are my brother. These are my sisters. These are my friends. Those who surrender to me. You see, that's what it says at the end there. It says, "Who does the will of my, uh, whoever does the will of God will be my mother and my brother and my sisters." You see, those who believe on Christ. The Bible says that in um, in John's Gospel, um, chapter six, the will of God is to believe on Him who He sent. It's Jesus. So He's showing. That there is hope. And may I say, and, and can I close with this? May I say that those who have put their faith in Him, though we can fail Him, but have clung to Christ. And when I say believe on Him, please, it's more than just an intellectual thing. It's a belief that will root your heart. It's a belief that will change your life. It's a belief that clings to Him day and night. It's a belief that trusts in Him for your hope and your salvation. It's a strong belief. Those who believe in Him will be kept to the end. Isn't that lovely? The Bible says nothing shall separate us from the love of God. The Bible says in um, 
Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And in Hebrews chapter 13, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Those who surrender to him are adopted into the family of grace. They're set free from their wrong. They have salvation in Christ and they will never be lost. What have we seen today? We've seen the rejection of Jesus by his family and the religious community. We have seen Jesus' response to their rejection, warning them of the unsafe ground they're on if they continue in their hard-heartedness. And we've seen also the reassurance. These are my brothers. These are my family. These are my sisters. Those who believe in Christ. One of the books I was reading had this excellent quote that I conclude with. It reads like this. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Savior of the world. He is God in the flesh, the firstborn from the dead. He is the maker, defender, redeemer of all. He is Christ the Lord. He is the rock of ages. He is the foundation. He is the cornerstone. And then this line. When I shared this line with a colleague, friend of mine, he said, Ben, don't preach the sermon. Just read this line and sit down. So I've left it to the end. It's so good. Please get it. When he is your unforgettable savior, you need no worry about the unforgivable sin. When he is your unforgettable savior, you need never worry about the unforgivable sin. Let's pray. I suppose the ultimate question you need to answer right now Is he your unforgettable saviour? Have you embraced him as Lord, Redeemer and King? Then you need never worry about the unforgivable sin. Maybe you, like me, at this moment, need to pray for someone we know or love who hasn't yet crossed the line, who may yet be in the no man's land of the unpardonable sin. Won't you name them before the throne of grace that they might move from their position of rejection to wholehearted reception? that Jesus might look them in the face one day and say, my mother, my brother, my sister, and my friend. Thank you, Lord, that we're not left hopeless, but there's great hope in Christ. Deliver us from sinning against knowledge. Help us to embrace you as our unforgettable saviour that we need never worry about committing the unforgivable sin. In Jesus' name, amen.